like to start by thanking uh, the organizers for this invitation and also wish you all uh, 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 safety and, and, and luck in, in dealing with this crisis, which is affecting all of us. Here in the hospital, I'm still in the hospital at St. George here. We were all having meetings to discuss the contingency plans and changes to our practice. So uh, uh, you know, we, we pray that this will uh, pass off without too much damage to our society and to the world. Um, but uh, life must go on. And I think it's uh, important that we continue our educational programs. And this is why I'm, I'm very grateful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about this uh, topic, the gut microbiome. And uh, uh, there's a lot of interest uh, amongst the population. Lots of your patients will come to you and ask about gut health, ask about probiotics and prebiotics and so forth. So I think having a kind of an educational program is quite useful to kind of summarize uh, what's going on. And I'll give you a, a presentation that I give at every level, uh, from the top scientific level to engagement with the public. Uh, they're the same slides, but I'll, I'll, uh, because the evidence base is so overwhelming now and I think so exciting. And I hope by, by the end of this uh, talk that I'll convince you that this is something relevant and also something very exciting in medicine. I think it's a new revolution. Um, so just by way of introduction, I'm the uh, Professor of Medicine here at St. George UNSW and the Director of the Microbiome Research Center, which uh, was created in 2017, uh, following some uh, um, a lot of work uh, and, and uh, funding from several uh, stakeholders from the federal government, from the state government, from the university, uh, from uh, philanthropy and so forth. And we're very proud to have established this actually here in, in southern uh, Sydney. And uh, essentially what we have is a, is a center that is embedded in a clinical campus. Um, it's uh, the idea of having it embedded in a hospital is that everything that we do has to be clinically relevant. And we have five themes that cover almost the entire breadth of the Australian government's uh, uh, healthcare priorities, cancer, women's and children's health, infection, inflammation and immunity, mental health and neuroscience and critical care. And in the space of two years, we've got now over 60 collaborative research projects uh, that span the, 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 the entire country and internationally as well. So this is happening at your doorstep and we're very, very proud to have it and uh, welcome your advice and your uh, encouragement and support of, obviously over the next few years. Uh, this is just a picture of the team. Uh, we, we've grown very quickly. This is about 25, 26 of us at the moment. And uh, again, very proud of the fact that uh, two thirds of the team are uh, women and uh, very diverse and very uh, uh, strong and resilient and all very enthusiastic and wanting to do some good. So uh, I titled this the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And some of you will be uh, familiar with this uh, eternal question, uh, which is the, uh, uh, what, what is the answer to life, the universe, and uh, everything. Uh, uh, some of you might think that the answer is uh, 42. Um, however, I hope to convince you that uh, the answer, in fact, might be uh, the microbiome. Of course, this is tongue in cheek, uh, and there are lots of skeptics, and we have to have healthy uh, uh, kind of questioning mind and skepticism, but equally also maintain an open mind. And uh, if there is something in this uh, uh, new revolution, then we'll try and harness that so that it can benefit uh, our patients. So just by way of introduction, just to get some kind of terminology out of the way, we talk about the microbiome, we talk about the microbiota. Uh, the microbiota are essentially all the trillions of microorganisms that inhabit uh, us either inside or on, on us, uh, be it uh, inside the, the, the gut, uh, the lungs, on the skin and so forth. Uh, these could be bacteria, viruses, archaea, uh, bacteriophages, uh, fungi. These are all the microbiota. And all, all the collective genomes are known as the microbiome. So that's the genetic power of all of these organisms is what we call the microbiome. And I would like to add to that definition also what they produce. So that kind of uh, collective metabolomic output, all the metabolites that they produce are also a part of that definition. Now, you'll be uh, uh, surprised to hear that, in fact, we're mostly microbial in terms of the number of cells. Uh, but certainly in terms of the number of genes, we're outnumbered 200 to 1. So there are 200 times more microbial genes than human genes. And by definition, they're all producing uh, uh, metabolites and, 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 and proteins and other substances that can have a major impact on our metabolism. Now, it weighs about 1.2 to 2 kilograms. That's about the weight of the brain. Uh, but it has the same metabolic output as the liver. So, you know, that kind of industrialized zone inside your body that handles uh, 
all of the metabolism, the breakdowns, the synthesis, all of these things, uh, the, the microbiome, particularly in the gut, has the same kind of capacity um, as, the, uh, uh, as the liver. Now, the way you acquire your microbiome is quite fascinating. Uh, in fact, uh, from uh, the moment of conception and during that kind of growth in utero, there is exposure to maternal uh, metabolites and some argue some actual microbial products and maybe even some uh, mi microbial uh, 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 organisms. However, let's assume that you're born uh, sterile and then uh, this thing then starts to acquire uh, all sorts of microbes from its environment, from the mom and so forth, and then it stabilizes by the age of three. And uh, that kind of stability is maintained unless it's shaken by uh, quite dramatic interventions like with antibiotics, for example. And we'll talk about That's this in a minute. Professor Hello. Ilamaki. Oh, can you hear yeah. me, Professor Ilamaki? I can, Sorry. I can, yes. Yeah, I can hear that. you. Yeah, the slides don't seem to be coming through. Ah, so right. The slides are being changed over as you're talking. Um, yeah. So we, we, are they changing now? Can you see them now? That's changing. They're changing now. So oh. you got to... Um, maybe is it okay to leave it in that, in that mode because I think this is not the projection mode, but just the uh, regular. Would, yeah, would that be all right? Is it it's still stuck on the first slide? Ah, no, that's not. Uh, <laughs> it's um, changed now. You got it. You got some photo from Japan there on there now. I'm not sure what that is, but that's correct. Yeah, that's right. So this, in fact, is a is a little video. I, I wonder if it will play, but uh, shall we try? Give it a go. Yep. Is that playing? Yep. Yep. So this is a kind of a, a journey uh, on a hitchhiker's guide. And this is going uh, inside the uh, GI tract, starting from the from the beginning in, in the mouth. And you swallow inside the esophagus and you end up in the stomach. And we're now in the stomach. And you can see that the most important thing in the stomach is actually gastric acid. And that's your first line of defense. And if you look, uh, you will see the mucus, you'll see some microorganisms that are attached to that mucus and live in that mucus uh, gel layer. Uh, we'll start moving down into the small bowel and you'll see that the concentration of those microorganisms will increase. You can see the villi here with the uh, uh, kind of uh, flying around and then these uh, bacteria are kind of trying to associate with that gut barrier and that interaction is very important in terms of what happens uh, to the host. So if these are healthy microorganisms, they'll be interacting in a positive way and keeping out the pathogens. Equally, if they're the wrong type, they can cause problems. As you go down into the GI tract, the oxygen concentration becomes less and you enter an anaerobic environment. And there you can see that the actual volume of that microorganisms increases quite dramatically. So the bulk of the microbiome is actually in the, in the colon. And that's where you get all the, the different types of microorganisms. Some of them are uh, motile and invasive, and others are uh, uh, less kind of motile. They all do a function. Uh, they have a very important function in terms of educating your immune system protecting you against invasion by pathogens, and most importantly is hopefully what you're seeing on the screen now, which is the actual metabolism of all of the products that we dump in the colon. So these are uh, uh, bacteria that are metabolizing, for example, things like indigestible fibers. Uh, they're generating metabolites like short-chain fatty acids that then have a function uh, for the colonocytes. They feed the colonocytes. They interact with the, uh, with the mucosal immune system. Uh, they detoxify uh, xenobiotic uh, substances and so forth. And they generate things like neurotransmitters. So these are very important uh, functions that the microbiome does. Uh, now, the, one of the crucial questions in this field, and this is something that you, you uh, uh, I'm sure, have wondered about, is where does it come from? Where, how do we acquire that microbiome? So I said that the in utero environment, we assume it's sterile, although there's a lot of debate and dispute about that one. But let's assume it's sterile. Once the baby is born, the exit uh, into the world, either through a normal delivery, like uh, you know, through, uh, through the vagina, 
or through the cesarean section will have an impact on what microorganisms you acquire. Uh, this is a nice study that tried to trace uh, which um, wh where these microorganisms come from. I'll just remove this thing here because it's... Uh, and this study looked at mothers and their babies and, and sampled the mother's oral cavity, the skin, the stool, the vaginal swabs, and then they monitored the baby's microbiome and on day one, day three, and, and at four months. And what it shows is that the majority of the organisms that you find in the baby are actually acquired from the mother during that period. And there is a degree of uh, kind of niche selection so that the mother's gut microbiota will end up colonizing the baby's gut. Uh, equally, the oral cavity uh, is the same and so forth. So that initial kind of exposure comes from the mother. And this is very important in, 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 in medicine because the idea that the mother passes on whatever microorganisms that she has to her baby is quite crucial for public health. If she passes on a very diverse, balanced microbiome, I think that's a, a good start in life. Equally, if they pass on a dysbiotic or you know, the, the lacking in diversity microbiome, that can have consequences. And this is demonstrated by this uh, study that was published last year, looking at infants who were born to mothers with inflammatory bowel disease. And they, obviously, the, in inflammatory bowel disease, the mothers would have a very uh, disordered microbiome. And this abnormality is then transferred to the babies. And if you took the uh, stool um, uh, from, from, from those uh, uh, mothers or the babies and you put them into germ-free mice, you're actually transferring these kind of uh, immune abnormalities. These are adaptive immune system it is disordered and you can replicate the basic problem in inflammatory bowel disease in these mice by transferring that uh, microbiome. And continuing on the kind of the, 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 the line with pregnancy, this is a, one of those kind of landmark studies that was published in 2012 and looking at what happens during pregnancy. So the Assuming that this is a healthy pregnancy, the mother uh, who becomes pregnant starts to accumulate uh, a, a weight, so the weight goes up during pregnancy, and we assume that this is due to the to the baby and the placenta and so forth. But there is in specifically an accumulation of fat, and this is despite the fact that the mother doesn't necessarily eat more; she's not necessarily eating for both of them, and equally is actually expending more energy. Yet the mother, most pregnant women, would accumulate a degree of fat that is at least four kilograms. And now, quite astonishingly, if you took uh, the poo from the mothers in trimester one and the poo from trimester three, and then you transplant that into mice, you find that, in fact, the, the ones that get the trimester three become obese. So they develop obesity, uh, even though they're eating exactly the same as the, as the, as the other mice. And it, it turns out that, in fact, the, there is a, a natural change in the microbiome during pregnancy that goes from a normal kind of balanced microbiome to something that is altered and something that is a lot more pro-inflammatory, if you like. And you just wonder why, why that is happening. Now, it turns out that, in fact, that kind of change correlates with the ability to extract more energy from the waste product that the mothers have. So it's a kind of an inbuilt uh, safety or protective mechanism in case the mother, you know, is there's a famine or there's a kind of hunter-gatherer uh, existence where you can't guarantee the next meal and so forth. Now, this is great if we're hunter-gatherers, but if in fact uh, this is a, a modern living with a lot of processed obesogenic diet, you just wonder whether, in fact, coming into pregnancy already with this dysbiosis or this kind of disordered microbiome might be the reason why we're seeing this uh, 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 dramatic increase in modern illnesses like obesity, diabetes, allergies, asthma, and so forth. So this is something that is very actively being pursued at the moment in research and something that obviously has an impact on uh, uh, the patients that you see. Now, you're the right uh, kind of group of people to, to talk to you about this because you will see these women that come in either planning a pregnancy or already pregnant in the early phase before they come into hospital and see the, uh, the kind of secondary and tertiary care. So all that important advice about preparing for pregnancy and preparing your gut health, as it were, so that you have a successful and trouble-free pregnancy is incredibly important.
So this is why, and, and this is, uh, I'm just telling you about the research that is happening at your doorstep. This is uh, the, the so-called mother's baby study, which we have just launched uh, just, uh, just before Christmas. And this is designed to look at the microbiome of women who are planning pregnancy. So this is a preconception study. We're looking for women who are uh, actively trying to conceive and we want to study the uh, microbiome by looking at specific, uh, easy to collect samples. Uh, and this is to, to find out whether this question of what you come into pregnancy with is relevant so that you can potentially predict who's gonna develop the complications such as hypertension, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and so forth. And what we're looking for, uh, this is a, a, a longitudinal study that will monitor women through, before pregnancy, throughout pregnancy, and then a year after. Uh, it's a statewide, the whole of New South Wales will be involved. We've already started at St. George Hospital, uh, extended this to Nepean and Royal uh, uh, Hospital for Women, and there'll be another five or six different sites across the state, hoping to recruit about 2,000 women. And uh, we take, obviously, uh, detailed assessment of the microbiomes, uh, uh, some questionnaires about diet and so forth, and about mental health. Uh, and this is kind of the, uh, the most comprehensive study that will ever be done in, the, in, in terms of pregnancy and the microbiome. Uh, in terms of collection samples, we collect a stool sample, uh, a skin swab, a vaginal swab, an oral swab, as well as a blood sample. These are very, very easy to collect, and most women that we speak to are very happy to participate. Uh, we'll also sample the babies when they're born for up to a year, and this is just a skin or a, a mouth swab uh, as well as stool samples at uh, the same time points as they come in for their regular uh, uh, baby checks. Uh, if you are interested, and hopefully I can pass this on to you later, this is the uh, our project manager, uh, uh, Naomi Strout, who's, who's uh, will be very happy to uh, uh, speak to if you're interested in participating in the study, uh, through your patients, of course. Now, let's just talk about the, uh, the, the essence of what, what goes wrong with the microbiome. Uh, now, I mentioned this uh, the kind of the gut uh, barrier, the mucosal barrier. It's quite a unique structure. It's really quite fascinating uh, looking at the difference between the small bowel and the large bowel. So you've got your uh, mucus gel layer. This is kind of a bit of mucus. That's where most of the microbiota either li live just above it or in it. And then you've got your epithelial cells. So it's a single layer in the small bowel. Then you've got all the different types of cells, the, 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 the small bowel cells. You've got plenty of immune cells underneath. You've got lots of uh, antibodies, secretory IgA, and so forth. All of these things designed to kind of balance your interaction with the external environment, you know, with all of these insults and potentially useful nutrients that you're ingesting. Now, what you want is a single layer there because you want to absorb all the good stuff. You want to have a, a decent exchange. You want to keep those microbiota, uh, 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 the good ones there, so that you can have a decent interaction, educate your immune system, develop tolerance, uh, and not overreact to uh, things that are actually quite benign, but equally activate your immune system so that you're able to mount a robust defense of that barrier should there be any pathogens. In the large bowel, you've got two layers of mucus, so it's a little bit thicker, and that's where most of the kind of the, 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 the microbiota live and interact, and in particular, work on fermentation and digestion of that indigestible fibers that you're dumping there and generating potentially very useful things for your health. Now, things can go wrong, and we know that uh, lots of things can cause that barrier to become uh, diseased and leaky. It's a kind of a subtle change. It's not something that you would be able to see necessarily if you looked at that lining by uh, colonoscopy. Uh, but things like, you know, obviously a disordered diet, diet that is bad, uh, unhealthy diet, you know, all the fast foods, processed foods, and so forth, stress, both physical and psychological, burns, alcohol, infections, all of these things can weaken that kind of barrier and lead to uh, what we call a, a, a leaky gut barrier with translocation. So translocation means anything that is in the gut lumen is able to then translocate into a different compartment that can end up in your circulation. And if it's in that circulation, be it vascular or be it lymph or whatever it is, it means it can get elsewhere. It can be translocated to the kidneys. It can be translocated to the brain. It can be translocated to uh, any other vascular beds elsewhere in the, in the body. And that's really the essence of the microbiome related uh, uh, diseases and conditions that we will talk about. I mentioned diversity and diversity is good. You want a mix of uh, microorganisms, bacteria with different functions so that they can give you that kind of resilience uh, 
an ability to withstand any insult from the environment, be it invasion by pathogens or dealing with toxins or uh, uh, you know handling all sorts of challenges. So that, that diversity usually correlates with good and uh, balanced health. If you've got loss of diversity, you've got dysbiosis, and that's that converts your microbiome into a pathobiome, something that is actually bad, because what does a pathobiome do? It gives you chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation, low grade, uh, is the root of all evil. Every Almost every condition that you care to think about, whether it's cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, they have chronic inflammation at the heart of them. And I think this is a very, very important concept. So this is the essence of that kind of how the gut microbiome is relevant to things that are outside of the gut. It's the fact that that imbalance creates a source of chronic inflammation and translocation of all of those byproducts elsewhere in the body and distant from the gut and causing problems. Now, again, I just remind you that uh, what I said about these microorganisms, they are little factories uh, present in your gut generating metabolites, be it short chain fatty acids, aromatic amino acids, activated compounds, post-drug modified xenobiotics, all of these things can actually uh, act on receptors. And this is the currency of communication between you as the host and the outside world. So the kind of take home message from that is that we are all united in biochemistry. Now, this is an important concept because if you do a microbiome analysis, as I'm sure you will ask me at the end of this lecture, you all of these kind of tests available, looking at your gut microbiome and finding out who's there. Now, that's a little bit misleading because you might find uh, something that is completely different from another person that does not necessarily equate with having a dysbiotic or a bad microbiome because there is a degree of overlap and redundancy and ultimately what matters is actually what's being produced so that's the kind of the the metabolomic that omic in particular is perhaps much more important than what produced it what bugs actually produced it uh, and we can talk about that in the questions later now uh, lots of positive dysbiosis as i mentioned the most important is diet because that's the one thing that we keep doing every day and depending on what you eat, that's what you feed your microbiome, and that will determine what they produce as a result. So a balanced, healthy diet, perhaps something like the Mediterranean diet, is always kind of uh, 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 correlates with a degree of health and protection against certain conditions like cancers, cardiovascular disease, and obviously dementia. Uh, but it's not just what you eat, it's what you add to the food. And there's some very uh, uh, convincing evidence that certain things that we eat, like emulsifiers or artificial sweeteners, or generally speaking, any processed food, is actually quite harmful to your microbiome because it can lead to increasing the virulence of those microorganisms. And in that host, in that environment, they can then cause that leaky gut, cause that translocation, and cause that kind of uh, uh, dysbiosis that gives you a low grade inflammation that you see in many conditions. Second, so diet and the additives is important. Physical activity and exercise are incredibly important. And you're all familiar with the, you know, the, 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 the lifestyle uh, that correlates with health. Physical activity is incredibly important. If you're sedentary, if you uh, do not do any exercise, all diseases, you know, the risk goes up, whether it's, again, heart disease or cancer, or whatever it is. So physical activity and exercise. And there's some fascinating work showing how that directly impacts on your microbiome. Smoking and alcohol, it goes without saying, can affect the microbiome in a negative way. Aging, now there is a kind of a, a, a change, if you like, a loss of diversity as you age, but it is not inevitable. It's not something that happens with everybody that ages. There are people who are centenarians whose gut microbiome is actually younger than people who are in their, in their 20s. And that's probably, these are the people that have withstood the challenge of, uh, of, of the environment, the, anything that we can throw at them, they've survived. Usually they have very, very nice, balanced and healthy uh, microbiomes. Infections, viral infections, bacterial infections, all those are things. Antibiotics, the most dramatic way of shaking up your microbiome. And medications, and I'll talk a lot about medications in a second. Again, just to emphasize that things like uh, stress, both psychological and physical, can also change your microbiome per se.
So this is a, 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 a very nice study. I'm proud of the, that study because it was published in my journal in GUT. And, and this is a picture of the Irish uh, uh, National Union rugby team. Uh, and this was a unique study because the, uh, the actual uh, researchers managed to get 46 of these incredibly strong fit men to donate uh, samples of poo so that they could analyze them and find out whether their microbiomes were healthy or not. And to cut a long story short, these athletes who are you know, obviously supreme athletes exercise a lot. Yes, they're a bit heavy, their BMIs are high, but they're all you know, made of uh, muscle and, uh, and incredibly fit, both metabolically, cardiovascularly, and their microbiomes are incredibly diverse. And if you looked at the metabolome, it's also incredibly healthy and it's got all the right things in it. And indeed, if you looked at the balance of those microbiota, you start to see some common recurring themes. For example, one of the most exciting uh, uh, microorganisms in this microbiome field is the so-called Akkermansia. Akkermansia mucinifila is one of those bugs that likes mucin, so it lives in the mucin, it can munch away at the mucin, and its presence usually is inversely correlated with obesity and metabolic syndrome and diabetes. So it's, it's that, you know, what that means is that if you have it in abundance, it protects you against these kind of metabolic uh, conditions like obesity and diabetes and uh, metabolic syndrome. So that is quite interesting. And I think there's a lot of work and interest in that. And I'll talk a little late, later in the, in, in, in the lecture about how these could become uh, next generation probiotics because they have a specific function. Now, this is an interesting study. You might have heard about it in the news. It made the headlines because uh, it had to do with uh, athletics. These were uh, again, uh, supreme athletes who were running the Boston Marathon. And uh, what they'd done with these uh, elite athletes is that they'd collected their poo, you know, five days uh, in a row before the event and also five days after that. And what they showed was quite, uh, qu quite interesting in, in that they, there was uh, a, an increase in a certain type of bacteria called Vilanella. Vilanella atypia in particular was enriched after the marathon event. And if you then take those Vilanella atypia from those marathon runners, and then you uh, give it, inoculate it to mice, and you get these mice to exercise on treadmills, and uh, uh, you can exercise them until they get exhausted and they can no longer exercise. But if you transplant, if you actually give them those Vilanella atypia, you increase their kind of maximal exhaustive treadmill time by 15%, just simply by transferring uh, those violent atypia. Now, they went on to kind of investigate the mechanism of that, and they showed that, in fact, uh, if you looked at elite athletes, all of the genes that uh, are, are involved in metabolizing lactate into propionate, these are kind of uh, short-chain fatty acids, uh, are in enriched. They're, they're much higher uh, uh, in, in those elite athletes. And it turns out that, in fact, uh, it's the propionate that actually gives you that uh, um, <clears throat> increased metabolic, uh, sorry, increased uh, exercise performance. So uh, when you exercise, you go to the gym, you're not fit, you know, you get lactic acid in your muscles, everything is sore. That lactic acid can actually, uh, uh, you know, get, go, get through the epithelial barrier into the gut, and that can impact on your vilanella atypia so that it's enriched, and then it converts that into propionate. So it's quite a fascinating kind of cycle whereby this regular exercise, you upgrade those genes, you upgrade the ability to transfer your lactate and convert, convert it to propionate and gives you enhanced performance. Now you might think that this is kind of you know esoteric and okay so these are elite athletes but think of the potential here for altering someone with cachexia or somebody who's you know with, with uh, functionally quite deficient and again by the promise of some kind of manipulation of the microbiome, you can enhance the uh, quality of life and the performance, I think this will become really quite, quite attractive in the future. I'm just trying to move this one. Okay, now medication, because this is the one, one kind of uh, uh, defining privilege of doctors is that we are able to dish out medications. We all do it, you guys do it more than anyone. And uh, it's uh, obviously with good intentions and, and obviously we give them because we think that they are useful and obviously they all are. But there are lots of side effects and most of the time we don't understand the, the cause of those side effects. But this was really a, a, a very nice study published in Nature a couple of years ago and that looked at 
over a thousand different drugs that are not antibiotics. These are not antibiotics. And looked at their effect on 40 commensal uh, microorganisms, mostly bacteria, in culture. So you've got 40 of these things that you commonly find in your gut. And they've tested those non-antibiotic drugs on them. And they found that 24% of the drugs actually had a direct bactericidal effect on some of those microbiota. Now that's quite a staggering statistic. So what you think are just regular drugs that are not antibiotics are actually killing some of the microbiota in your gut. Now that can, that's a kind of a, a two-way thing. So they could be killing bad guys, they could be killing good guys. And this explains why sometimes certain drugs uh, have beneficial effects that we can't explain. You know, the classic one is metformin or the statins. You know, they protect you from cancer. You know, it's not really clear why, but there's very exciting evidence coming out to show that, in fact, that's mediating that uh, inexplicable uh, protection against certain uh, conditions for which they are not prescribed primarily. Now, in terms of the bad guys, uh, the, the top group of drugs that came, you know, number one in terms of its effect in this system were the antipsychotics. And again, you'll be very familiar with the side effects of antipsychotics because if you're treating schizophrenia or a bipolar illness or whatever, you know, one of the common side effects is obesity and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And in fact, the, 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 these drugs have the maximal effect on the microbiome and they knock off things like uh, uh, th those beneficial bacteria that protect you from obesity. So again, this has kind of opened up a, a, a new field of, of research and something that will become very, very interesting. Now, I'm a gastroenterologist and um, we are as guilty as anybody in terms of starting patients on proton pump inhibitors and acid inhibitors. Yet I'm, I'm famous for being the, you know, having a, a, a big problem with patients staying on PPIs forever. And I, I showed you the video at the beginning with the gastric acid, and that's your first line of defense. We've spent millions of years developing that machinery so that you can have your first line of defense against ingested microbes. So acid is there for a reason. And just simply from the early 90s onwards, we started wiping out acid completely with the proton pump inhibitors. And now, if you look at the statistics, 40% of the British population above the age of 60 are on long-term PPIs. The figures here in Australia are not far lower. Uh, a big chunk of our population are on PPIs. They just have no acid in their stomachs. And just you know, by first principles, you know, this will have an impact on your microbiome, period. You will be accumulating in your gut a collection of microorganisms that is not balanced. And I'll show you some evidence for that. So I've mentioned antipsychotics, I mentioned PPI. These are things that you prescribe very commonly. You're also very familiar with the opioid epidemic and, 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 and this big problem, particularly in the States and so forth. Again, it turns out that things like morphine have a direct effect on, uh, on, on the microbiome. I, I, apologies about the order here, but this slide just shows you that the PPIs uh, have a profound effect on your microbiome. This study was published in 2016 and replicated several times. Um, uh, this is another study looking at the combination of um, acid inhibitory drugs with uh, uh, whether it's PPIs, H2 antagonists, or antibiotics. And this is looking at the effect uh, during early childhood. And if you see here the accumulation of uh, uh, whether it's one medication, no medication, one medication, two, three medications, and your risk of obesity increases uh, uh, significantly as you take more of these during the uh, first two years of life. So these drugs do have consequences. Now, this is the morphine slide. And this, again, just shows that the, uh, the use of these things, uh, if you give morphine, it does have an impact directly on the microbiome. It leads to enrichment of things like Enterococcus faecalis, and this is a nasty one, one of the nasty microbiota. And it's nasty because it, it, it's implicated the number of diseases, and it's kind of cropping up as one of the, uh, the arch villains. Uh, it's also one that uh, we, can, we sometimes see in, 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 um, in sepsis and so forth. So Enterococcus faecalis is one of those nasty ones. But there's a, a beautiful study that showed how uh, uh, these things are actually the mechanisms of them, and it, it turns out that this morphine treatment induces that change in the gut metabolomic profile uh, compared to the placebo group, and, and this is what mediates the, uh, the negative effects. Now, again, in, in, in general practice, you will come across a lot of uh, mental health problems. 
a lot of anxiety and and uh, and and more mental health issues and uh, i can't think of anything more relevant than the gut to brain problems whether it's in, in relation to psychiatry whether it's in relation to neurodegenerative disease and so forth and this is for for a very simple reason is that the the gut and the brain are very strongly linked by a variety of different mechanisms for a start they're actually hardwired so the uh, outside of the brain, the gut is the most innervated organ and has a very rich uh, uh, neural supply. That's the first thing, that's hard wiring. You've also got the immune system, which directly communicates with the brain through the release of cytokines, inflammatory cells, and so forth. So that's your immune system impacting on it. You've also got the metabolic uh, interaction, and I mentioned the, uh, the release of short-chain fatty acids I also mentioned that these microorganisms are generating in the gut your neurotransmitters. So in fact, they're synthesizing things like your GABA, noradrenaline, serotonin, acetylcholine. They're altering the precursor levels for things like tryptophan. You know, all of these things are incredibly relevant to all of the neurological uh, uh, conditions. And th th there's a kind of a, a very exciting field developing at the moment, studying the effect of uh, the gut microbiome, not just on things like anxiety and um, and and bi bipolar illness, but also in relation to things like Parkinson's disease uh, and neurogenesis disorders and dementia. So th th these are kind of very very rich uh, research areas, and I'm sure over the next five years or so, you will start to, to hear a lot more about this uh, in, in general practice. Uh, so uh, suffice to say that most of your patients coming in, you know, a, a healthy status correlates with. Uh, 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 a healthy CNS function correlates with a healthy uh, gut-brain access, and there's absolutely no uh, uh, debate about that one at the, at the moment. We have plenty of evidence. Now, the, the, because of this kind of uh, interaction between the gut and the leaky gut barrier, and I mentioned that the translocation to other sites, uh, a lot of different specialties in medicine started to look into this because you know, there were things that they could not explain. You know, why does an MI happen at that particular time and, and, and all of these things? And, and indeed, the, the, there are several metabolites that are produced by gut microorganisms, usually from dietary metabolism, metabolism things like L-carnitine and, 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 you know, all the kind of red meat rich uh, metabolites that have been linked directly to things like atherosclerosis, hypertension, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, all of these things. The list is really expanding all the time. And it's now beyond associations. Most of these things initially were published as associations. So you do 50 of this, you know, of one disease and 50 normals, and you find a difference in the microbiome. Now we're getting much more sophisticated. Now we can show what the mechanism is. We can show, for example, if you take that stool from uh, uh, someone with a disease and then you transplant it in the mouse model, you create that phenotype, you transfer that disease and so forth. And, and this becomes very relevant to uh, uh, understanding the pathways and the mechanisms. So this is something that is really very exciting because, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's all about predicting risk and prevention. Hopefully, you know, you can you'll be able to prevent that. Uh, now we're in the in the COVID-19 uh, uh, era at the moment, unfortunately, and uh, we always talk about the microbiome as if it's confined to the gut. But the other thing that we do, obviously, is breathe in. So you're breathing in from the environment. You're breathing in all sorts of microorganisms, uh, including bacteria and fungi and, and, and viruses, of course. And again, there's a direct link between the gut and the, uh, and, and the, and the lungs. Uh, and indeed, uh, there's lots of interest at the moment in, in the pulmonary microbiome and how that can impact on outcome of lung disease and in particular in critical care. So patients that go into ICU, for example, say, you know, somebody who's uh, in respiratory distress due to a virus or something. Now, you've got this gut, if it's healthy, if it's, the, you know, if it's uh, balanced, does this actually, can this predict a positive outcome? This is a very valid and, and testable hypothesis. Uh, equally, if, uh, uh, you know, if, you, if your gut is dysbiotic and you have a viral illness, a severe illness, and you end up in, in, in uh, ICU, you get intubated, ventilated, all of these things can impact on your lung microbiome and whether that also has an impact on your outcomes. These are all studies waiting to be done, but I think it offers a, a unique opportunity for making uh, progress. Now, let's just switch to cancer because again, you, you will see lots of your patients uh, diagnosed with that. It's, it's, uh, it's, we've made huge advances in terms of understanding the cancers. Uh, 
but the most transformational understanding has come really in the last uh, five years or so. Uh, quite often, it's lifestyle that mediates that kind of risk of cancer. Uh, genetics plays a small role in some of those kind of hereditary conditions, but really it's the environment. And environment and the diet and exercise, all of these things, of course, act through the microbiome. And with specific examples, we're now working out some beautiful mechanisms to explain that link. Now, as I said, I'm a gastroenterologist. We have a, a huge global burden of GI cancers, esophagus, uh, stomach, colon, pancreas, liver. If you put them all up, you know, add them all up, this is a, a huge burden. And in all of these cancers, the microbiome is the crucial instigator and trigger for the events that give you that chronic inflammation ending up in, in the cancer. So just uh, kind of the concept of what we call procarcinogenic driver bacteria. These are the ones that start the process. For example, in the colon, you know, you've got a, you eat bad, you know, poor diet, you don't exercise, you have a bad mix, that kind of can initiate, those bacteria can initiate, the, you know, things like the Enterococcus faecalis can cause that initial kind of inflammation. And then you get what, in the latter stages, you get the passenger bacteria, things like the fusobacteria. And fusobacteria is the uh, one, one, one other uh, very nasty bug. And fusobacteria are, you know, ones that usually are found in the in the oral cavity. Um, they, they're kind of anaerobic, and they kind of crop up in most of the can cancers that we've studied. And I'll give you examples um, uh, in relation to colon cancer because that's perhaps the best understood. So, so this is a study where they took patients with colon cancer. They took uh, the, their stool and then they transplanted into mice, and they kind of watched what happened to those mice if they had a carcinogen as well, or if they were uh, um, uh, germ-free mice. And just by the transfer of that pool from a patient with colon cancer, that instigated the development of precancerous conditions and colon cancer, or it speeded up the, uh, the process if they had a carcinogen on top of that. So you can directly uh, impact on the nastiness and the, and the development of that cancer by transferring that microbiota. Now, that's in relation to actual pathogenesis, but this fusobacteria kind of story has now filtered into diagnosis and also screening. So you're familiar with uh, FIT, fecal immunochemical testing for bowel cancer screening. We're relying on the presence of blood. Uh, sometimes it's a bit like tossing a coin because if you've not bled, you know, you're not going to be in those kind of days when you're testing your stool, it might not be picked up. But if you combine that with a microbial signature, for example, the fusobacteria, you can actually salvage or recover 75% of those CRC samples that would have been missed if you just relied on FIT. Now, the fusobacteria is just one example, and at the moment, the research is trying to develop more sophisticated ways of uh, diagnosing those cancers during the screening. So that's one, one, one thing. Equally, in terms of prognosis, now, you know, say you've had an operation and they're taking the tumor out, they send it to the pathologist, if you assay the tumor content of the fusobacteria, this has been shown to be predictive of your prognosis. So these are the two, uh, the, the two uh, graphs here. This is Kaplan-Meier curves, and you can see that the, if you've got high uh, uh, DNA content of fusobacteria, these are the red lines here, uh, you, you do a lot worse than if you had a lower or negative fusobacteria content of those tumors. So that's pathogenesis, diagnosis, prognosis, and, and this is just the start of this kind of revolution with using the microbiome in, in that context. Now, um, the, I'll just skip that one in the interest of time, uh, but one of the most intriguing things is that, again, we talk about the gut microbiome, and we ignore the oral cavity. The oral cavity is the kind of the, the portal through which you, do, you, you acquire most of your gut microbiome. And it turns out to be also incredibly important in predicting the risk of disease. And for a number of years now, we've we've kind of we've not you know we found papers suggesting that the oral microbiome and its imbalance predicts the risk of pancreatic cancer. And it just doesn't make sense because the two are kind of too far away. But if you remember what I said, and that video demonstrates it beautifully, you swallow the whatever is in your mouth. And then it goes into your stomach. If there's no acid, it can survive that journey. It gets into your duodenum. And the duodenum is where all the plumbing for the pancreas is. That's where your pancreatic duct and your common bile duct and all of these things you know, interact. And 
three things reflux in or out. You know, this is just a basic principle of plumbing. If you have a duct and it secretes stuff, you know, things can get in and out. And it turns out that in fact, in pancreatic cancer, and this is a, a beautiful study published uh, just a, a couple of years ago, that showed that in fact, the microbiome of the pancreas is incredibly important. And that oral microbiota is very relevant. And it's relevant because it can induce this, uh, what we call peritumular innate and adaptive immune suppression. So you're setting up that chronically inflamed organ to have very poor immune uh, response. So it's immune suppressed. So any clones of cancer that develop can then obviously uh, persist and, and cause a problem. And, and that was the first study ever published in that kind of, uh, in that field, but it was soon followed by an even, uh, uh, even more impressive study. And that was in uh, last year in the, in the journal Cell. And that looked at pancreatic cancer patients, the very few that actually have long-term survival. So most, you know, only 8% have a five-year survival. So, but if you have a collection of these patients and ones that have the short-term survival, again, and, and, and you try and figure out why they have long survival versus short survival using the established knowledge, whether it's genetics, whether it's, you know, the, the, the uh, histological, whatever it is, you couldn't. Yet, if you looked at the microbiome, they were able to actually separate them uh, with uh, uh, definitively by using those signatures. And it's the same principles again, the fact that you know, if you have a more diverse microbiome uh, in the gut, actually you have a, a better prognosis. And that's because it correlates with the immune system. It correlates with the immune readiness and ability to fight off uh, any kind of uh, uh, things like cancer. So that, that was quite exciting. And that was published last year in, in another very decent journal called Cell. Now, uh, it, when it comes to cancer treatment, that's really where uh, most of the microbiome uh, kind of fraternity uh, got really excited, and in particular, the oncologists. So the oncologists were never interested in the gut microbiome or poo or anything at all. They, they were always very sterile uh, uh, people that couldn't care less about the, any, 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 any microbiota. However, three papers were published uh, back to back and I'll just uh, show you these three here, published in Science, another very decent journal. And two of them dealt with melanoma, and one dealt with renal cell cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. And this was all in the context of immunotherapy. Now, you'll be very familiar with immunotherapy, and particularly in melanoma, because melanoma used to be fatal and absolutely horrible disease, but immunotherapy came along and kind of revolutionized the management of this condition. And the Nobel Prize last year was awarded to the discoverers of immunotherapy. Now, these three studies showed that you can predict response to immunotherapy based on your gut microbiome signature, your gut microbiome signature, which again is just like, sounds like, you know, sci-fi. But in fact, again, if you think about it in terms of the effect of that gut microbiome on your immune system, it all kind of falls into place. Now, essentially what they found, again, is the same principles, you know, high diversity is good. You transplant the microbiota from uh, the ones that respond to the immunotherapy, you tra transfer that responsiveness to the mice. So you give the mice the same cancer and you uh, give them the poo from the responders, they then respond to the immunotherapy and the opposite if they get the poo from the non-responders. So again, it's very, very exciting stuff. Uh, and the kind of the take-home message is that uh, th this gut microbiome is emerging as a way of strat stratifying patients in terms of the responsiveness to treatment. Now, this has been kind of taken forward and there are now clinical trials in the United States and other places using fecal microbiota transplantation from responding patients, ones that responded to immunotherapy, to new patients. Uh, now, this is, um, and obviously we, we await the results of those studies, but this again is incredibly exciting. Again, I'll skip that. So in the last, just uh, uh, remaining kind of a few minutes, I'll, I'll talk about manipulation of the, uh, of the gut microbiome because one of the most important concepts here is that we had the genomic revolution. You're able to do all your genomics and then predict uh, who might have a, a predisposition to a disease or an outcome, but then you're stuck because you can't change your genes. You know, short of just knowing that you have a risk and perhaps modifying your risk factors, there isn't anything active that you can do to change that inherent genetic risk. Now, this is completely different when it comes to the microbiome because the microbiome is imminently manipulatable. You can actually change it. You can change it by diet. And these studies have been done. So if you 
go, for example, on a Mediterranean diet and you stick it for one year and you are at risk of dementia and you monitor your cognition over that period. This study was just published a few weeks ago and I'm sure some of you will have heard about it in the news. It has a very positive effect. And it has a positive effect because your microbiome has changed because of that change in the diet. So that's so the diet is one way of doing it. And we're all familiar with the kind of unhealthy diet and how unhealthy diet correlates with unhealthy outcomes. So that's one way of doing it. Prebiotics are the constituents usually of plant cell walls. So they're not, these are not bacteria. They're, these are just inert substances that are usually found in um in 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 plant cells and these are usually the feed for the good bacteria so the good bacteria can actually digest and you know metabolize these prebiotics and then that re leads to enrichment of uh, those prebiotics that have a health promoting effect so that's what a prebiotic is now that's possible and the concept is valid same way with probiotics well it's actually the the the, the bacteria themselves that can promote health and you're familiar with all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the studies and the, and the work on lactobacilli and so forth. But I'll show you why that's not kind of necessarily uh, translatable to clinical benefit. Symbiotics are the combination of prebiotics and probiotics, and postbiotics are the metabolites that are produced by the probiotics. So now you can package up whatever healthy kind of metabolite, and and that's been tested in some in some conditions. Finally, antibiotics. So, so these are things like rifaximin that can maybe change your uh, microbiota and, and they, they are helpful in certain circumstances. Uh, genetically modified microbiota are coming kind of uh, not, not quite there yet, but they, they'll be producing certain things. So that's another thing. And finally, there's the fecal microbiota transplantation. And this is kind of the, 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 the thing that usually creates the headlines because it's so appalling and 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 people you know find it either disgusting or fascinating talking about poop. Now just a couple of studies to show you about the probiotics because I know there's a lot of interest in the group about probiotics and your patients will be spending billions and billions of, of, of dollars on probiotics. Now th th this study was published a couple of years ago and that looked at the kind of interaction between the host and probiotics and it asked very important questions. If you give probiotics to someone can you predict whether it's going to be beneficial or not? Now, I'll give you the straight answer. It turns out, as you might expect, that everything depends on the host and it depends on the probiotics themselves. And it makes sense. I mean, if you send, for example, a group of people to a desert and expect them to survive with no means, no support, no infrastructure, no, you know, no food, no water, clearly they're not going to survive. Yet, if you prepare that environment and you are receptive and there's, you know, there's accommodation, there are different skills, all that kind of stuff, and there are no enemies, you know, then they have a chance to survive. It's exactly the same with the probiotics. If you just throw them in, one, they might be weeded out immediately, uh, either killed by your acid. Let's assume that you, know, you put them in an acid-resistant thing to get down, but they're then competing with, with your own microbiota. So it doesn't guarantee that these ones would actually necessarily be successful. Clearly also, uh, you know, it, it, you might not need them. They might not be actually missing in that particular person. So at best, the use of probiotics is potluck. And this is why in this study, which was actually a combination of both animal studies as well as human studies, they did not show any benefit. And in fact, they, they showed that it, it, it was completely random, uh, but you could predict them by host and microbiome features that would allow you to say whether it's going to be successful or not. Now, the other very important study is, is one, in the, and this was from the same group published in the same journal back to back, is that situation where you take antibiotics and you think, well, it might be a good idea to take probiotics now because that will help me recover from the negative effect of the probiotics. So they tested that, and they tested that in a very unique way. So they said, okay, we will give antibiotics, but before we give that to these healthy volunteers, we will store some of their own stool so that we can give them an autologous microbiota, uh, fecal microbiota um, FMT, autologous FMT. Now, it turns out that in fact, if you do this and you don't get your autologous FMT and you just get the probiotic, uh, your recovery going back to your pre-antibiotic thing is actually delayed. So if anything, that particular mix of probiotics has delayed your normal recovery 
uh, of, of your own microbiome, which was healthy. So the, the take-home message is that, in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very complicated. It's not in any way predictable at the moment. And to a great extent, it's not advisable to just take any probiotic off the shelf and expect it to have a beneficial effect. And we can discuss that later in the discussion. Uh, now, I, I mentioned next generation beneficial microbes, and, and that's the acromancia. And that's reasonably exciting at the moment because uh, there's good uh, uh, basic studies showing that uh, either using it active or, in other words, alive or heat inactivated, or indeed, if you just take a, 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 a specific protein that is present on its outer membrane, something called AMUC 1100, that has the same beneficial effects. And this could be druggable. It could be actually you know, developed into a drug. And indeed, we've had some uh, uh, initial clinical studies published by the same group. Uh, this paper here just published last year in Nature Medicine. And this was a supplement with Acromancia and mucinifila in overweight and obese volunteers. And this was proof of concept. They gave it uh, either live or heat inactivated. They were both equally uh, effective, no side effects. They gave it for three months, a daily supplement and it improved several metabolic parameters. Now, this is just the start of this, and we have to do, obviously, rigorous clinical trials and validate them, but it's, it's quite promising. So that's one example of a potential second-generation probiotic. Another one is something called Fecalobacterium prausnitzii, or F-prau, uh, and that's kind of relevant to things like inflammatory bowel disease, and again, that's being developed as a next-generation probiotic. Uh, FMT, now, this is uh, uh, a bit of a kind of... Um, uh, you know, there's an endless uh, stream of jokes that, that usually associated with that. The idea is that you take somebody who's so-called healthy and you get their stool and then you transplant it either from the top end or from the bottom end. Um, and from the top end, the initial studies were quite disgusting because they were they would infuse through a nasogastric uh, or nasojejunal tube um, large volumes like you know, half a liter of, uh, of liquid poo. Uh, thankfully, you know, things are moving away from that and now they're being kind of capsulized, or if you like, the, the, the term they use is crapsulization. These are crapsules, and these are freeze-dried and um, a lot more palatable. But whichever way you look at it, it's actually uh, quite a, a messy kind of uh, uh, subject. And again, there's a lot of work being done. Uh, now, these are four studies published um, just a few years ago, two of them from Australia, as it happens. One last year from uh, uh, published in JAMA in the context of ulcerative colitis. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. And it turns out that, in fact, the main determinant of success is that concept of the super donor. So amongst us, there are people who produce very high quality poo that is incredibly diverse, that is able to heal patients with inflammatory bowel disease and potentially heal other conditions. But what the parameters of that are, we have uh, still no you know, strong handle on that. But my expectation as somebody who's working in this field, been working in it for 20 years, is that we will be moving away from FMT, but taking that knowledge from the FMT, distilling it into a more predictable, robust, clean, uh, laboratory-prepared microbial transplant that then is given to people that are missing those microbiota and then putting them into clinical trials. They have to be done in clinical trials. We cannot do them just randomly and dish them out to everybody who thinks they might work for obesity or for depression. This is just the wrong practice. Right, so uh, I'm just gonna skip that in the interest of time, but this is kind of my last slide. And this is just uh, kind of the, the, the way of the future, which is we talk often about personalized medicine. And I think this is coming. We've talked about it when, you had, when we had the genomics, but it didn't really deliver much. But if you have an open mind and you have uh, you think of the, uh, the, the the approach of the patient as uh, you know from every angle, you know you'll be able to assess the, the the genetic heritage. You'll be able to assess their microbiome signatures, and then you'll be able to actually decide what is needing done, whether it's lifestyle changes plus a supplement of some kind or something to change the microbiome. Ultimately, that's going to be relevant to prevention. Uh, so the, the, also the idea of personalized nutrition uh, in diagnostics and finally in therapeutics. And I think that's where most of the effort at the moment is, is dedicated of predicting who's going to respond to certain therapeutic approaches. Now, whatever it is, I think uh, uh, this is an incredibly exciting period. And we really have to kind of prepare the next generation uh, 
of uh, doctors and practitioners to understand this, to be able to kind of dissect out those papers that are published in the, in the scientific journals so that we as clinicians can actually take control of this revolution and uh, you know, allow it to deliver clinical benefit by doing the clinical trials, by understanding the mechanisms and so forth. Uh, so thank you so much for your attention and I'm very happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. I think you can hear me now, Professor? I can hear you, yes, absolutely. Yeah, there are, yeah thanks for that. There are a few questions. Um, I'll just launch into a couple of them. So there's a question about um, fermented foods and whether they act as a pre or a probiotic um, yep. and can you have too much of them? I think that's uh, one of the things that you, I just Google search yep. fermented foods, you get all sorts of websites and bits and pieces. So are they, are they a good thing or a bad thing or? Or, or not yeah, like. again, so, no, no, I think you know, fermented foods uh, usually have a, a healthy collection of uh, probiotics, and, and it's a bit more natural that way than, say, just taking a capsule of probiotics. So to some extent, I think if you look at the epidemiological data, usually, you know, they, they, they tend to correlate with, with good health. What I have a problem with is, uh, is, you know, I mean, if it's a natural product that, you know, the, the, you, 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 it's fermented and it's, it's tested over generations, it's fine. But a lot of these products have sprung up on the market in, in, in the last few years. And again, because they have the word fermented or whatever, you know, it, there's an assumption that they're actually quite beneficial. But in fact, if we've looked into that evidence and most of these products that you find on the market now that are, you know, like, you know things like the drinks and so forth, actually have no uh, robust clinical data. I keep an open mind if they can convince me that you know those things in a clinical trial have led to some benefit, uh, I'll be the first to buy them. But uh, you know, as things stand, the concept is valid, and uh, the traditional fermented foods that you know, as I said, in 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 certain populations, they've they've had them from generation to generation. You know, like the yogurts, for example. I mean, the old yogurt is is a uh, is an excellent medium of uh, of probiotics. Uh, I think that that's uh, that's much more uh, convincing than 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 products off the shelf. I, I have a problem with that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and what about um, say irritable bowel syndrome? Is that related to the microbiome? And I guess with that same, I had, I've had a thought as well. I mean, all all the abdominal symptoms like flatulence or pains or you know constipation, diarrhea, all those sorts of things that patients get. I mean, is that is the microbiome a big part? Of the, of the ideology of those things? Yes, uh, that, that's a, a very easy one, uh, Matt, because essentially anything in the gut that um, it, it, you know, is the product of your, uh, of your microbiome. So if you're putting a lot of fiber in your gut and you've got bacteria that can digest those fibers and generate gas, you'll get flatulence. It's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's not necessarily a, 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 an unhealthy situation. Uh, what is unhealthy is the response to it. You know, sometimes if the response is exaggerated, and uh, th that's where you have that kind of interface between, um, you know, somebody who just, you know, it doesn't bother them, and somebody who, whose life becomes then uh, uh, dominated by those symptoms. But in terms of IBS, yes, there is, a, the, you know, th there will be dysbiosis. Uh, remember that 24, 25% of IBS patients probably had an infective um, episode before that. So there's a kind of a post-infectious IBS. Uh, etiology to it and when I see the IBS patients we go through all of the history and dissect out the kind of the, what contributed to that and quite often there's an event I mean they were normal and then suddenly those ones actually are much easier to manage because it, there is a genuine uh, dysbiosis that was triggered possibly by some kind of illness or infection or inflammation that altered that, that, that balance and then we talk about ways of dealing with it and the fact that it's a finite uh, uh, period, it's not something that's going to last with them. For the and then again, the patients have always had abdominal pain and always had a disruption, and they tend to have other, you know, other kind of uh, symptoms, functional symptoms as well. So, so, so the different kind of phenotypes, and this is why IBS is, is very difficult to uh, blame entirely on the microbiome because there are, uh, you know, things that the microbiome generates that could be very healthy and not necessarily something that is pathogenic. Um, but th there's, there's also work coming now through on FMT and IBS because you know th there's that desire to help the patients. They're so desperate, and they try anything. They, they would have already tried low FODMAP diets. They would have tried, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, going on the gluten-free and, and you know, all, all of the different things that you're familiar with. 
and considered going to someone to get an FMT. So it, the, the, most of the work that has been done on the FMT in IBS, and this is mostly stuff that hasn't been published yet, I'm kind of familiar with that, uh, doesn't work essentially because I explained it's, it's completely potluck. I mean, you're getting somebody else's normal. You don't know, you know, whether you got one, two, three transplants, whether that's going to last for two, three weeks or a month or whatever. So as a as a treatment, it's completely unpredictable and you know it's it's just completely useless. Uh, but better still, I think with with IBS patients is is a is a much more understanding relationship with their doctor, uh, specialist or otherwise that can explain the symptoms, explain the pathogenesis of them, explain why they happen and how to manage them. And most importantly, if there are uh, you know, psychological issues to confront them and to actually offer other types of treatment. So there's a lot of very, very interesting work coming out about CVT and other, other ways of you know, dealing with the psychological issues associated with F FMT. And you know, that might be a way out for some patients. But in, in relation to kind of altering the, the microbiome, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the minority of patients in whom a trigger was a microbial uh, um, uh, you know, insult, uh, like a post-infectious IBS, and those actually respond very, very quickly and very uh, predictably. Okay, thank you. And, and with that, you mentioned that PPIs, obviously, and um, the sort of negative effects that they could have on the microbiome. So the question is, I mean, in, in which patients and, and, and how should we, you know, consider weaning PPIs and how, how should we do that? Is that something we think about for all our patients? Uh, yeah, so, so I'm uh, kind of, I'm hated by the, um, uh, by the PPI in the industry. I think I'm in, in public enemy number one. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a gastroenterologist and, and I love the PPIs when they're treating something that they, they are needed for. So if someone has an ulcer or bleeding or you know, horrible esophagitis or whatever. Yes, you know, you can treat it and definitely they're, they're wonderful. And they wipe out your heartburn. I mean, you know, they're, they're very effective. The problem is that the majority of patients who are on PPIs, actually, there's no indication for being on a PPI. Uh, and you will look through, and you know, almost every patient that comes to, you know, who's over 60 or whatever, you look at the list of medication, it's almost like it's a mandatory, uh, you know, item on, on their medication. And quite often it would be because they had a, you know, they had some, you know, abdominal pain ten years ago, or they, you know, God forbid, they were diagnosed as, you know, as having some reflux, esophagitis, or whatever. And the 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 the, the right thing to do is to question. Or people, you know, on on aspirin or on, you know, NSAIDs are taking it intermittently. They're not really. They've never had any complications from it. There's no reason to be on it all the time. And mm. the, the issue here is, is to go through the history, go through the indications, find out why they're on it. If there's no reason, just uh, uh, withdraw it. Now, this is where I caution about the withdrawal of PPIs because the PPIs are uh, obviously very powerful acid inhibitors. So they switch off your proton pumps. And there is a phenomenon that is very well established. In fact, it was you know, work that uh, we did uh, many years ago back in Glasgow when we studied acid secretion. And that is the rebound acid hyper secretion. So when you stop the inhibition, you know, two or three days later, the acid secretion is double, three times as high as it was before you started the PPIs. So to a great extent, you know, the symptoms come back with a vengeance, and those patients then, you know, obviously hate you uh, because you've stopped their, you know, the, the, the drug that was making them feel human. So the way to withdraw the PPIs is it, it's got to be very, very gradual. And I go, you know, in the clinics, I would go with them very, very gradually, give them a detailed plan about how, uh, you know, protracted that thing. So don't stop them suddenly, but equally, you know, you, you can, for example, you know, if they're on 20, you can cut it down to 10 and you take it on a daily basis, then, you know, take it for a week or two weeks, then you can take it every second day, then every third day and so forth. And then you take it PRN. And I think that's a kind of a more healthy situation where, they just have a supply and they take it as required, as opposed to being on it all the time, you know, with no, the pH is above seven most of the time. Right, okay. What about the um, H2 antagonists? What, how do they fit into that? Do they, do they have an effect or are they, are they a better alternative to go to? Or? Yeah. So the H2 antagonists are obviously a lot weaker, um, mm. but, but they still retain, I mean, you know, some of them are very good at, uh, again, the, the response to the acid inhibitors is obviously genetically determined. And uh, again, we've done, you know, studied thousands of patients on, on acid inhibitors so that we can see that somebody on, you know, Zantac uh, 300 would have pretty 
good acid inhibition, pH above four, all that kind of stuff. But uh, so, so again, it's it's unpredictable. But they're definitely weaker, and theoretically, mm. their effect on the microbiome is less. But those comparative studies haven't haven't been done. But generally speaking, uh, I mean, it, you know, a weaker uh, acid inhibitor, provided it's safe, of course, and not contaminated, uh, you know, is is, uh, is 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 a better option than being on, on something that is definitely going to, you know put your acid up to uh, wipe out your acid completely. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, another question regards psyllium. Is psyllium regarded as a prebiotic? Yeah, so so, so the, 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 you know, the, the, the definition of it, it could be, yes. I mean, it, but if, if it's shown to uh, increase the, the proliferation of these um, uh, you know, health promoting uh, bacteria, then, then, then yes, but quite often there are lots of um, uh, natural products that, that, that we take. And in fact, you know, there, there's some really interesting evidence that some of these health, you know, not, not necessarily things that you buy from the health food shops, but, but uh, that have a, a, a very positive effect on the microbiome. So it restores your diversity, for example, or at least the proliferation of probiotic type bacteria. I, I, I'm a, I'm a you know, I have uh, uh, more time and and, and more um, theoretical kind of theoretically convinced by prebiotics than with probiotics because I think giving you know probiotics off the shelf is just not, not doesn't quite make sense. But giving something that is uh, is is potentially going to be uh, metabolized and digested by the, uh, the the bacteria in your gut, kind of a, a little bit closer to um, uh, you know a little bit more convincing. Okay, just just so everyone knows, there's about ten minutes to go. So if there are any questions, uh, send them through. Um, so I guess I think you alluded to this during the presentation, but do, how, how do we know how good our microbiome is? Do we need to know? Because um, you mentioned all the associations with all sorts of illnesses, which don't really yeah. have, you know, signs until they're they're present. Um, do we need to know about that? How do we know? And yeah. Should we be getting it yeah. tested or that sort of stuff? So, so that that's a very important question, and 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 thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain that because, um, uh, I mean, it, it's it's human nature that you want to find out about your health and and be able to predict whether you're, you know, on the right kind of trajectory or whether you're running into problems or whatever. The problem, so so yes, testing is 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 great if uh, testing is actually going to be useful. In other words. The result of that test is going to impact on your management, and that result is actually validated. It's a result that um, it has some scientific evidence base that it correlates with specific, you know, healthy outcomes. So this is what we're all working. This is why we, you know, we we kind of uh, set up the, the the microbiome research center is to actually provide the evidence base, and then, you know, we we would be able to give you those tests, those tools. That could be beneficial and useful for you to, you know, to use on your patients. The problem in medicine is that if, uh, you know, science and technology advance a little bit, all of a sudden, you know, all the venture capital goes into those kind of uh, potentially useful technologies, and then all of a sudden, you know, these biotech companies spring out, and then they start dishing out those kits, and then test your microbiome. And there are quite a few of them on the market, and and you know, some of them use very good technology. In other words, you know, they use reasonably um, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, technology to look at those microbiota. But what they're looking at is a snapshot. What they're looking at is a very superficial view of who is there. And the classic example, I mean, you know, if you, if you, if you, I'm sure all of you get these reports back from the different companies, and then you send them back to me to interpret and to find out what, you know, what, what, what it means to the patient. They would be so superficial in, in, in that they could say, for example, you know, you've got um, a, a deficiency of acromantia, or you've got too much, you know, of this and that. But they're, they're looking at those groups, and within that group, there could be a number of members of that group that could be either bad or good. So the resolution of that of those tests is very limited. So it's not good enough to just say, well, I've got lots of firmicutes, you know, and these are these are the good guys. These are the guys that will generate the short chain fatty acids. So I'm really okay because I, you know, lie on top of that graph. 
because that is a very superficial insight into what this group means. And, uh, you know, so, so most of the tests are very superficial and most of the tests are essentially just looking at who's there. And I did, I, I went into great lengths showing you that video to highlight that it, it to some extent, the diversity is a good index. <clears throat> so that's something that they will give you. Uh, but by itself is not enough. Ultimately, what we are working on, uh, on the scientific side, not the commercial side, is to figure out what we call a multi-omic signature. So in other words, not just who's there, but what are they producing? And that will give you a much more complete picture of your risk of developing outcomes. And then what we want to do is actually use this in every single patient that we see at the clinic would go into a clinical trial. So, you know, your diabetics, for example, and I'm going to manipulate the microbiome in this way, either by giving them probiotics or by, you know, changing their lifestyle, but then monitoring those tests, those tools that we provided to see whether they can actually change and predict whether someone is heading in the right direction or not. So that's the best way of doing it. It will take time. Um, we have to be patient. We can't just jump the gun because every time we've done that, we've done it with genomics and now it's just a complete mess. Uh, you know, we will lose an opportunity to actually impact real change in our practice of medicine. So my plea is that, you know, we, uh, you know, curiosity, they're, you know, they're cheaper. I know the, the prices have been slashed. But the reports that they produce, as fancy as they look and as nice on the graphs and everything else, you know, th they are usually meaningless uh, for an individual. Now, the other thing is that most of these companies, uh, some of them do it better than others, will be storing all of the data that they're getting from every single person that submits their, uh, their, their sample. And then they will give you a graph and say, you lie there on that graph of the healthy people. Now, that definition of health is very subjective because this is based on a questionnaire that those participants, those customers have filled out. And then obviously, then they say, well, have you got this? No, I have you got this, I haven't, and, and so forth. Equally, they, you know, you say, okay, well, I have anxiety, I've been diagnosed with this, and that is not validated. So that cannot be the basis for plotting those graphs and seeing that I am I'm actually, oh, it's horrible because I lie in the at-risk group for developing dementia or at risk group for developing this and that. You see, that, that is very, very dangerous because it creates anxiety and, you know, on the one side and then having something that is actually healthy and you look like you're in the middle of the good group gives you that kind of sense of, um, you know, satisfaction that is perhaps misplaced. Okay. Yeah, so it's a, obviously a developing area. Um, quick question. I know gut parasites is a huge topic. Uh, doing amoeba, blastocystis, um, but maybe really quickly, it's just a question about whether, mm -hmm. in your opinion, the treatment of those ever involves fecal transplant for those conditions. I know they're complex conditions about what's pathogenic and what's not, but yeah. fecal transplant. So, so, one of the sure, FMT works beautifully for one condition, and there is no debate about that one. That's uh, that's uh, C diff, C diff infection. And that's how it all started. I think you know that that you know landmark paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. It was only 16 patients that had FMT, but it was such a wonderful cure that very quickly that was replicated, and now it's part of all the guidelines. And the reason why it works is because it's a very simple condition. So you have an, you know you take antibiotics, you see if proliferates, if it's toxigenic, you produce a toxin, it gives you the colitis, and it can be fatal. So to some extent, if you overwhelm the system with somebody else's healthy or normal poo, that does the trick. But it, with parasites, actually parasites are quite fascinating because um, you know some of the parasites are commensals. In other words, they just get found in the analysis of the stool and they get blamed for you know, having you know, uh, IBS or whatever it is. But in fact, there are lots of people that have them that have no symptoms. But in, in a few you know, patients, they can be kind of the, uh, the, the culprits for some of the symptoms. And occasionally it's worth trying some antibiotics or whatever to, to see if that helps. Uh, but in terms of giving FMT, I think, again, it's just the same principle applies. This is a very complex uh, kind of um, uh, you know, you know, uh, niche, you know, that, that you're transplanting a, somebody else's poo into, into a situation where you have absolutely no guarantee that it would work. The, the, so I personally don't think this this uh, this works. I've seen a few cases that come to me and they've had a horrible outcome. Uh, I've seen some patients where it didn't make any difference; they're still having it. 
so to some extent, I think that the, 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 it's not proven. That case is not proven for parasites. And you're far better off treating parasites as parasites. If, if, you, if they're proper parasites, you treat them with the proper drugs. If they're ones that are kind of commensals, you know, and the patient is persistent, you might want to try some of, the, some of those drugs. But not FMT. I wouldn't advise FMT. Yeah. Sure, sure. And um, the question about uh, what's your opinion about genetically modified food in light of digestion? Yeah, so uh, I mean, so so genetically modified food. Uh, it, well, there's lots of debate. I mean, this is a very controversial kind of subject, and um, uh, you know, the, the fact that certain countries allow it and others don't uh, just reflects that kind of division in, in opinions. I'm pretty neutral about it. I'm not. I don't have any strong opinions about it in terms of, uh, you know, its impact on, uh, on 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 your gut health or whatever. Uh, I, I think uh, you, you know it's used on a large scale. There's lots of studies to show that it's not harmful. So I think it's just a, it, it's a more of an emotional debate. But it, it's it's um, I, I'm pretty neutral about it. I, I, I don't you know I don't necessarily think it's a it's a it's a it, it's a bad um, option. Um, it, it, it's it's one that I think it's uh, it, it, it's a kind of transatlantic uh, divide about uh, about genetically modified um, crops and so forth. All right, and I think, uh, sorry, just checking There's a few more questions, but we'll just have a look. Uh, uh, does gastric sleeve affect the microbiome? Does that, any comments yeah. on that? Oh yes, absolutely. So, so again, it's just a, a, it's a beautiful question actually, and a very, very fascinating one because uh, bariatric surgery, it was one of the first conditions to be studied in terms of the microbiome uh, because you're altering the plumbing. I mean, you know, you, you are changing the the kind of the, the the natural route into the into the rest of the gut. And there is no doubt that 